What's up, Facebook? So happy to see you. Prophet David Taylor here for uh, my monthly teaching entitled No More Genies. Now, No More Genies comes on the second Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, so that's right now. Second Thursday of every uh, month, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay? Now, just to give you a brief understanding of what No More Genies is, no More Genies is where we examine what I call Christian myth, where we examine religious myth, where we examine things that we've been taught that just aren't true. We throw that out, and then we substitute that old wrong understanding for the right understanding according to the Word of God. Now, what I've been teaching for quite some time now, over a year now, is I've been teaching on the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And in my very first video about it, I explained the difference because sometimes the scriptures use the kingdom of heaven and sometimes it uses the kingdom of God. And there's a reason for that. And I explained that in my first video, so I encourage you to go uh, re-watch that and watch the whole series. Uh, so uh, uh, just to sum up the thought process behind it, I'm a firm believer that we preach and teach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ but we don't preach and teach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. And Jesus Christ preached and taught the kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is like this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And that's not what we preach and teach. We preach and teach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. Born again, born again. Get saved, get saved. Go to hell, go to hell. Excuse me. Miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. Born again, born again, get saved, get saved, go to church, go to church. Miss hell, miss hell, go to heaven when you die. That's not what Jesus preached. He did mention hell, and I've pointed that out. He did mention hell, but he preached the kingdom. He said, therefore, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this, because that's what he was bringing to us. He was bringing to us that personal relationship with him, where God became a man so we could see him, hear him, touch and feel him, and he could feel what it was like to be a human, so that Jesus, in his position now, could become a merciful and faithful high priest. So when he's up there interceding and mediating the new covenant that he died to, to activate, he understands both God and man. He understands both sides of the deal. So when the Lord looks at us, he doesn't say, I feel sorry for you. He doesn't look at us with sympathy. He looks at us with empathy. He says, I remember, I understand. Okay? So he preached and taught the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so that's why I think that's what we should do. So that's what we've been, what we've been looking at. We've been looking at the parables that Jesus taught concerning the kingdom of heaven. Now, we have looked at the parable of the sower, the wheat and tares, mustard seed, the yeast slash leaven, the hidden treasure, a pearl of great price, the parable of a dragnet, a homeowner with a storeroom, managing business accounts receivable. And that, uh, last month, we looked at hiring day laborers. Today, what we're going to look at, or tonight, what we're going to look at is inviting guests to a wedding celebration. Inviting guests to a wedding celebration. And remember, this is no more genies. So we're going to look at what the Lord says his kingdom is actually like versus some of the mythologies and some of the wrong teachings and some of the wrong ideas that we have made up to think that it's like and some of the, the denominationalism in the church sayings that don't have anything to do with what the scripture actually says, okay? So let's pray and we'll drop, uh, jump right in. Thank you, God, for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We honor you, God. We bless your name and kiss your lips. And another... Uh, uh, we, we thank you just for another night, oh God, or just for another day. Please fill me with the Holy Ghost, oh God. Please forgive me for any sin. Wash me clean by the blood of Jesus and breathe through me, oh God. Speak through me right now, oh God, so that what you want said will be said and what you want brought forth will be brought forth, oh God, so that we might have a proper and greater understanding of your word and you so that we might do what you want us to do. And in this time of darkness, that we might know how to rebuild in a way that's pleasing to you. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
All right, amen and amen. So tonight we're going to look at inviting guests to a wedding celebration or the parable of the wedding feast. That's in Matthew 22, okay? So I'm going to go there right now. Okay, all right. So I'm going to read Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 through 14, because that's where our text is for what we're talking about tonight. I'm reading out of the NIV. As you know, Matthew was one of the 12 that followed Jesus, a disciple, turned into an apostle. And Matthew wrote the first book of the New Testament. Matthew was a tax collector. He was very despised and disliked by his fellow uh, Hebrew countrymen because tax collectors would not just collect the tax for the Roman government, they would add on a surtax and pocket the difference. So if the Roman government charged you 15%, they would add on an extra 5%, charge you 20%, and Matthew would keep that extra 5 So as you can imagine, he was not the most popular man among the Hebrews. But it's just a testament as to how all different kinds of people from different walks of life can get along if you come together under the banner of Jesus Christ. Okay? Matthew 22, 2-14, I'm reading the New International Version. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people that they could find the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot, and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Oh my goodness! Look at the Lord, the master storyteller, weaving in so many truths with other things that he said, because he's amazing. So the Lord starts off by saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. That is analogous. The king is the father. The son is Jesus. If it's a wedding banquet, that means somebody's getting married. That's talking about Jesus Christ as the heavenly bridegroom getting married to his believers, which is the church. In this particular uh, parable, he's drawn a contrast between how Israel acted and then how he invited the Gentiles, but I'll get, to, I'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, so just so you understand what this is pointing to. So God said, my kingdom is like Father God is the great king. Father God prepared a wedding banquet. That means everything that happens at a wedding, you know, good food, good fellowship, good wine, <laughs> good fun for his son, talking about Jesus. Because Jesus is the bridegroom, and Jesus died to save his wife, his bride-to-be, which is believers in him. In the Old Testament, that was the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews. In the New Testament, that also opened up then to include the Gentiles. And, that, and the Lord is talking about that in this parable. But just so you understand, who Jesus is marrying is his believers. We're the bride of Christ, and Christ is the bridegroom. Okay? So he, God, sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. That is talking about God sending prophets to Israel. So God sent and continued to send his prophets to Israel to tell Israel that they were the chosen of God, they were the bride of God. They were the wife of God. And indeed, God in the Old Testament referred to Israel as his wife many, many, many times. So uh, the Lord is saying here 
that God sent uh, his servants there. He's talking about prophets. Okay? He sent his prophets to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. Now also, in some translations, it's also talking about angels when it talks about messengers. But remember, it's not until the book of Revelation that angels actually preach the gospel. From the time preaching happens, from the time the law and prophecy starts, it's always man, it's always us humans. So he's talking about the prophets he sent to tell the Hebrews that they were invited, that they were the chosen people. They were the bride in the Old Testament, and they were. And so in verse 2 it says they refused to come. They didn't want to come to the wedding feast and get married to Jesus. They didn't want it. Then he, the king, Father God, sent some more servants. So in other words, God didn't give up. He sent some more prophets. This is describing the entire Old Testament, by the way. If you want to understand the entire Old Testament relationship that God had with the children of Israel, it's right here. This is what the Lord is talking about here. Verse 4, Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened cow, cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Wow. So Father God is saying, uh, through prophets, he gets into more detail, and he says, Tell those that have been invited, I prepared my dinner. In other words, there's some good food. My oxen and my fattened cattle is going to be some good meat. Good food, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. My oxen and my fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. So in other words, God said, I've set it out. I've set off some fine meats. It's going to be some good eating. So I want you to come. Come to the wedding banquet because you're invited. You are who it's for, is what God is saying to the Hebrews in the Old Testament. It's for you to marry my son. Okay? But they paid no attention and went off one to his field, and another to his business. So in other words, they told God, anybody got time for that? So they went on about their business and told God they weren't interested. interested. And then the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. That's not how you know he's talking about prophets and not angels. Some of uh, the Hebrews seized the prophets, which is true, mistreated them, which is true, and killed them, which is true. Isaiah got boiled in oil, if you didn't know that. Yes, he did. Okay? The king was enraged. That's talking about Father God. Because some of his people seized, seized those prophets and mistreated them and just took them out. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Oh, my goodness. And this is talking about both the destruction that they experienced uh, under the time of well, after King Solomon, because King David and King Solomon was the apex. Then Solomon got the kingdom split, and then Rehoboam came. And then after that, they went to captivity, and the cities got burned down. And it also happened again after the time of Jesus. So they repeated the same pattern with the same exact result. Because Father God is enraged by that when he invites his chosen people to come and dine, to come join in holy matrimony with Jesus the Christ. And they say, no. All right, he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Oh, what a thing for God to say. God is telling us right there in no uncertain terms that we must respond to his call to be worthy. If God just call you and call you and call you and you don't respond, you don't come get what God is offering you, then you have made yourself not worthy. He said they did not deserve to come. What a thing for the Lord to say. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now these verses are very, very key. So uh, God did not stop getting his wedding, ban wedding banquet ready because Christ is determined to marry mankind because Father, Son, and Holy Ghost love us. They made us in their image. They made us to be the object of their loves and of their love. And as far as I know, as far as we understand it in Scripture, we're the only thing that God himself walks in. There's nothing else that's ever been described as being filled with the Holy Ghost except people. So we have a fantastic honor just as humans and the Hebrews had a, a fantastic honor 
as the chosen people. So then God says he doesn't withdraw his offer. He says this wedding banquet that I prepared is beautiful. So he says, but those I invited did not deserve to come. They slapped his hand away. So there's your first object lesson from this parable. That when God calls you, don't slap his hand away. Okay? A lot of people don't understand why they haven't gotten their blessings in life. The ones that they wanted. That's because you didn't do it the Lord's way. When God reached out his hand, you slapped his hand away. And you said you didn't have time for that. Okay? So he says, so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. That is when God opened up the kingdom to the Gentiles. Okay? And the Lord was actually crying over Jerusalem when he said that would happen. But God then opened up the kingdom. Now, Gentiles just means a non-Jew, a non-Hebrew person. God opened up the kingdom, and it's ironic I'm teaching this during Passover. God opened up the kingdom to the Gentiles, that's us, that's those that are not the physical descendants of Abraham, where we were born from another family besides the Hebrews. And they gathered all the people that they could find. That's God telling us to go to the highways and the, by, why, the byways in every corner of the earth and teach and extend the offer of his kingdom. Now, they're right there. It's where you see that we're supposed to be preaching and teaching the kingdom. We're supposed to be inviting people to the wedding supper. So in other words, Father God is saying, I desire to marry my son to his beloved. That the son is the bridegroom, Jesus is the bridegroom, and humanity is the bride. And Father God says, I've got a whole feast because we desire to marry mankind. What a thing for God Almighty to say. See, that blows my mind, that humbles my heart. That, that makes me fear and tremble, that brings tears on the inside. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, wouldest die for me? God is saying, I love you so much, I want to marry you. I want to be with you forever. I want to be one with you. I want to love you and I want you to love me for all of eternity. And I prepared a feast to celebrate that truth. Wow! And if you reject it, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about rejection in a minute. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. And then, in verse 11, but when the king came in to see the guests, that's uh, Father God, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are invited but few are chosen. Okay. Oh Lord, again, this is intense. Now, there's a bunch of different things you can get out of verse 11 or, or verse 11 through 14. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. Okay? And so, when we look back in the original language, that word wedding means just what it says, marriage, wedding, ceremony, wedding feast, nuptials. Clothes means a garment or raiment or clothing or apparel. So, what does that mean? There's different uh, interpretations there's different understandings. There's different ways that translators have looked at that particular thing. It could mean that anybody that tries to get in and is not saved, they don't have the garment of righteousness on them and you don't belong in the banquet. In other words, you can't sneak into God's kingdom. <laughs> It's saying that if you ain't right, and, and you ain't right with God, and you're not covered with a robe of righteousness, you can't just come in among the saints and think that you're going to get the same benefits of participation. Some people believe it means that. Some people believe that means Christians that have not lived the way that God wants them to live, and therefore have not received their wedding garment, uh, wedding clothes from God. So in other words, do you know how you have different clothes when you go to different events? 
Like if something is formal, you have formal wear. If something is casual, if casual wear, if you're going to the beach, that's definitely a very specific set of clothes because you wouldn't wear good clothes to the beach if you're going to play in sand, volleyball, play in the water, you know, whatever you're going to do. Okay? Or workout clothes. You don't want to work out in your business suits. You work out and work out clothes. So do you see how you have different garments based on different events? See, this passage could be referring to that there are garments in the kingdom of God that you have to receive from God to get into different events. And if you try to get in a wedding feast and you don't have a wedding garment, you're going to get thrown out. And then it says, Then the king told the tent to tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now, I'm going to have to do a whole separate thing on this. Uh, people are still arguing about once saved, always saved. And can you lose your salvation and go to hell? And sometimes people cite passages like this, saying that this passage is saying that you can be a Christian but still go to hell and be cast out into outer darkness. Just to give you a brief background, uh, there are four words in Hebrew and Greek that refer to the one English word that we translate as hell. So the word that we see as hell in English has actually four words in the Bible. Um, Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna. Okay? Sheol and Hades both mean the same thing. They mean the underworld. Gehenna is kind of a, a, a Greek term on a Hebrew phrase that means a garbage dump, where you take garbage to get rid of it and burn it. And Tartarus is only used once in the Bible, in 1 Peter 3, 6. And it means specifically the part of hell or the part of the prison where the angels that follow Lucifer are chained up. Because Tartarus is only used once in the whole Bible. And it's referring specifically to the angels that are chained that fell when Lucifer fell. So some people have taken this passage to mean that you can uh, get thrown out of the banquet and lose your salvation and go to hell. But in this particular passage, none of the words for hell are used. Hades, Sheol, Tartarus, or Gehenna is not mentioned in this passage. Now, you also have to cross-reference this passage with the other times the Lord used that phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because in another spot, I believe it's Matthew 15, 30, the Lord talks about how the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. So what he means by that is the same thing he's saying here, that the Hebrews got invited first, but they rejected it. So they're going to come and see the Gentiles in there feasting, but they're going to get cast out because they refused the invitation. So I'm going to do uh, some more study because I want to kind of dedicate a uh, teaching on that whole thing about what this is talking about and about the whole idea if, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. Can you or can you not lose your salvation? Because that answer is no. No, you can't lose your salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Just like you're born in the natural to your mother and your father, you can't bit more go up in your mother's womb and become an embryo again. You can't bit more go up in the womb of the cross. And so, no, once you're saved, you're always saved. But you can lose your reward. You can lose your place in God. That's what people don't understand. People think that just because you get born again, then all the blessings of God are automatic. And that it doesn't matter how you live because you're saved. And that's not true. That doesn't even make any sense. Why would the Bible spend all the time it does telling us how to live as Christians if how we live doesn't matter? And that's why I started this series, No More Genies. To help the saints understand that the, bless, the full blessing of God, because of course God blesses the earth every day. Of course he does or else we wouldn't have sunlight, air, food, or water. We couldn't function. If God didn't open his hand and give us grace and mercy every day, we're all dead. So, of course, there's a level of blessing that God bestows upon the earth without which, obviously, we couldn't function. But the full blessing of God, people are always talking about being above only, not beneath, in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, and I'm blessed coming in, and blessed coming out, and blessed in my basket, and blessed in my store, and all that. Okay, and Romans 12, 2 talks about the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Okay, the full blessing of God is not automatic. That is the root of the genie concept of God. That it doesn't matter how you live, it doesn't matter what you confess out your mouth, 
It doesn't matter what you believe in your heart. God's just going to give you his full blessing, and that's not true. That's the root of genie concept. People believing that just because you get saved, that it doesn't matter what you do after that, because God is just going to bestow his full blessing on you, and that's not true. So that's what we need to study in a little bit more depth, because you can lose your blessing. That's not the same as losing your salvation. If you want a practical comparison or analogy, here it is. Let's say a husband and wife have five children. And let's say they love all those five children, children they treat them all the same. But they got that one child who's just rebellious. They got that one child who's just always cursing them out. They got that one child who's just never doing what they say. They've got that one child who's always just going their own way. So let's say mom and daddy die. When it comes time to read the will, mom and daddy may have cut out that rebellious child and said, you get, like we left you $200 in the savings account, or you get nothing. Then that child is going to start to cry and whine and wail and gnash their teeth and say, but, but I'm your child too. How come I don't get a part of the inheritance? You, you didn't get a part of the inheritance because you didn't live right. Because you acted a fool. Because you went against your parents' wishes. Because you disrespected them. Because you didn't show any honor to mom or dad. That didn't stop them from being your mom and your dad. And that didn't stop you from being your child. But it did cost you your inheritance. It cost you your blessing. Can you see that? That's more along the lines of what the Lord is talking about here. But like I said, I want to dedicate a whole uh, session to it because I want to go through some more scriptures and I want to cross-reference a lot. But that's just a little taste to understand what I'm saying about how you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your reward. So if you got invited to the wedding supper, if you are a Christian, you'll always be a Christian. But you are not automatically guaranteed to get everything that God has promised to give you. Let me say that one more time. <laughs> if you are a Christian, you are not automatically slated and guaranteed to get everything that God has promised to get you. Okay? And so the Lord is saying here that the Gentiles got a chance because the Hebrews rejected the invitation. And if you look in, uh, starting in Genesis, if you look at the life of Abraham, all up until Jesus, the Jews just rejected. You know, they were up and down with God, they were unstable. And they didn't receive the fullness of what God wanted to give them. So eventually, because they rejected Christ, then the kingdom of God opened up to us Gentiles, and that's how we got in. Okay? But even in getting in, it's talking about how you are clothed. So now remember, you hear me, if you follow me at all, you hear me say it all the time. You can't just accept Jesus as Savior. You have to also accept him as Lord. Okay? That's also very, very key. To accept him as, as Savior is ABC. Admit, believe, confess. You admit that you are a sinner. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he died on the cross for your sins. And you confess that with your mouth as you are believing it in your heart. And if you believe he died on the cross, rose from the third day, ascended back into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God, if you believe that in your heart, you have to say that with your mouth. And if you ABC, you get saved. That's when you get born again. You get reattached to God. Your spirit becomes alive to God. Your sins are wiped clean, the slate in heaven. Your account of sins are wiped clean by the blood of Jesus. And the righteousness of Jesus, the righteous life that he lived, is conferred onto your account, and you are now righteous. You are now righteous in God. That's what it means to be saved, that I have been justified. And to be justified means I have been realigned. The same way you justify a text in a document is over here, you want to left justify it, or you want to center justify it. It means to line it up, right? So to be justified means that I'm realigned. I am now rightly connected to God because of what Jesus did. That's ABC. That's accepting Jesus as Savior. And it's glorious. That's why people preach and teach it so much. Because it's glorious. But they also preach and teach it because Jesus did all the work. That's why we love uh, accepting him as Savior so much. 
But the Bible says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, we have to accept him as Lord. And to accept him as Lord means you must take up your cross. You must crucify your way of life, your way of thinking, your agenda, your plan, your way of doing things. And that are choices that you have to make every day for the rest of your life. So accepting him as Savior is once for all time. That's when you get born again, the same way you come out of your mother's womb, once for all time. You never have to go back and do that again. We have to, never have to go back and get saved again. But the relationship you have with your mama after she gives birth to you is something that is literally built day by day. Do you understand that? Well, the relationship you have with Jesus as Lord is literally built day by day. You have to take up your cross, crucify your agenda and what you wanted, and learn how to do what the Lord tells you to do. That's HBO. So accepting him as Savior is as simple as ABC, admit, believe, confess. But accepting him as Lord is HBO, hear, believe, and obey. You've got to hear what the Lord is saying. You've got to believe what God is saying. Then you've got to do what the Lord said to you. You must obey HBO. Okay? And so that is every day for the rest of your life. So accepting him as Lord is an always-in-process kind of thing. It's a continual kind of thing. And so that's, you know, people don't always do that perfectly. We don't obey God perfectly every day of our lives. Okay? Accepting him and trusting him so that we can obey is something that we have to learn how to do. And that's what takes the rest of our lives to do. Okay? And so that's where I've discovered people get confused because they walk around talking about people ain't saved just because they're not perfect. That's not true. You could very well be a Christian, but you haven't surrendered to the Lord. You haven't given your life to him in the fullness. You haven't accepted him as the Lord of your life. So in other words, you still got your hand on the wheel. You still trying to run your life and you haven't turned the wheel over to him yet. See what I mean? So in this passage today, it's talking about your garments. What I was a garment is something that you wear. So what are you covered with? This is what people don't understand. If you try to get into a place in the kingdom of heaven and you don't have the right garment, you're going to get cast out. I'm going to say that one more time. If you try to get in somewhere in the kingdom of heaven and you don't have the right garment, you're going to get cast out. That does not mean that you are not saved. It means that you do not qualify for that room. You do not qualify for that feast. You do not qualify for that banquet. Because you do not have the garment to get in that hall. What do I mean by that? Let me give you another practical example. Okay? <clears throat> the difference between Christians that tithe, give offerings, and do alms, and Christians that don't. If you're a Christian, one of God's financial principles is to tithe. And to tithe means a tenth. It's a tenth off the top. Because it's a tenth that represents the whole. So out of every dollar God blesses you to make, and I know these are tough times right now where I'm teaching this, I understand it with uh, the beer bug across the planet, I do understand that. But for every dollar of increase that you get, you're supposed to take a dime off the top and give that to the house of God. That's called a tithe. But then you have something else you're supposed to do, and that's anything above the tithe, and that's an offering. And that could be whatever you want. That could be a penny. You give 11 cents, or you give a whole nother dime, you give 20%. That's up to you. Tithes, offerings, but then there's also alms, and alms are things you do for the poor. So in other words, you heard me talk about that category on my last teaching about how, you know, the sick, the shut-in, those that are in prison, no clothes, uh, food, water, that kind of thing, a uh, shelter. So when you do alms for the poor, when you help out someone that has less than you, or someone that's homeless, or someone that has no means to support themselves. When you clothe them, feed them, shelter them, give them something to drink. Go visit them when they're sick, shut in, and in prison. The Lord takes that personally. He says when you do it to them, it's like doing it directly to me. Those are alms for the poor, where you help people, where you help feed a family that can't afford to feed themselves. So that's actually what's going on on planet Earth in a massive way. There are a lot of alms being given now. Uh, where we're helping people that, that can't uh, take care of themselves. You see that? Well, some Christians very much live in that. Some Christians very, very much give God a dime off the top of every dollar and then an additional 
amount of money on top of that. Completely up to you. As much or as little as you want, above the 10%, and then alms for the poor. But some Christians don't. Okay, the Christians that don't are no less Christians. They're still saved. They're still Christians the same way that everybody that came out the same mama, y'all brothers and sisters. But, when God throws a banquet in the kingdom for the tithers, you're not going to be invited because you don't qualify to get in. Because you do not have the garment that qualifies you to get in that banquet because you have paid no tithes in this life. That's what that's talking about as well. So that's why I'm trying to get people to understand. you got to understand the difference between accepting him as Savior and Lord, being born again, being part of the kingdom, but then how you choose to live your life. Because whatever banquet he has, the Bible tells you right there, you've got to have the right clothes, you've got to have the right garment, otherwise you're going to get kicked out. And there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now again, I have to do a full study on that to explain, because you've got to cross-reference some other scriptures. But out there in outer darkness, people are crying. Some people uh, take that to be hell. Some people have interpreted that to mean just away from Jesus. The glory of the Lord... It's always where you want to be, but if you get cast away, like when the Lord tells people that they don't know him, or the bridegroom comes in and shuts the door, then you're going to be left out of what God is doing. And there are going to be Christians that weep and gnash their teeth. In other words, they're going to realize that they had an opportunity. They had an opportunity to be a part of what God was trying to do and they blew it. They said no. They did not prepare themselves. They did not get their garments together. And now they got cast out of that particular celebration. See that? So it's very deep. It's very complex teaching. So that's why I want to dedicate uh, some time to it. But the Lord said, many are invited, but few are chosen. There he goes again saying that phrase. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are invited, but few are chosen. What does that mean? That means that God is going to work with who shows up. And he's going to work with who shows up dressed the right way. Okay? He opens his hand, the Bible says there, to go out to the street corners and call anyone you can find. God opens his hand, but everybody don't show up. So God's going to, be, going to work with those that show up. And he's going to work with those that show up and are dressed for the occasion. So that's something that you've heard me say before, but well, I, what I will continue to say, and that is that you can't just bring God anything. That's a mistake a lot of people make, and we see that in the story of Cain and Abel. When uh, Abel brought his offering to God, Abel brought and killed a slaughtered lamb. God sent fire down from heaven and honored that offering. Cain brought fruits and vegetables. God did not honor that offering. Why? Because God taught Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel's parents, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You can't cover yourself with plants and leaves. God says something has to bleed and something has to die. Okay? He taught the first parents after they sinned that that's the only way sin is paid for, with blood and something has to die. So Adam and Eve obviously taught Cain and Abel. Abel listened. Abel believed what God said. So Abel killed the lamb and brought its broken body and shed blood. That's why God honored it, because Abel made a sacrifice in faith. In other words, he stepped to God right. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. He stepped to God in the right way. He came before God the way God told him to, with a sacrifice, with a slaughtered lamb and shed blood. Cain brought fruits and vegetables, and there is no blood in fruits and vegetables. There's juice, there's seeds, there's, you know, fuzz sometimes on the outside, there's little stringy things, but there's no blood. There's no blood and there's no flesh. Now, there's the meat of the fruit, but it's not flesh. It's not animal or human flesh. Now, that kind of flesh, okay? It's fruit flesh, not living flesh. And God said that to not do that. God said, do not bring plants and uh, fig leaves and twigs to try to offer that to me. That is not acceptable. Cain did that, and God didn't honor it. And then we know the story after that. Cain got upset and rose up and murdered his brother. But that's an example of what I mean. That when God says many are invited, but few are chosen, God invited Cain and Abel, and they were both taught the right way to accept to God. Abel believed it, Cain didn't. And Cain committed murder 
and then got cast out. Look at that. Look at that. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. That when God says many are invited but few are chosen, he opens up his hand and extends the invitation, but it's for those that step to him right. Those are the ones he's going to honor. And those that come before God any kind of way, those that come before God doing what they do. I'll give you another example of how true this truth is. It's a difference in the way people worship. When people come before God with form and fashion and tradition, and when people come before God seeking to glorify themselves, thinking that it's all about the worship team and all about the worship leader and who can sing and what songs we doing and all about us, you know, you know, doing whatever. If you notice, there ain't no Holy Ghost, ain't no flow in that, there's no anointing because God's not honoring that. But people that come before God to worship Him and they don't care about how they look and they don't care about being seen and they don't care about their own glory, but they come before Him to give Him glory and they get on one accord in doing so, then you see the glory of God come in the room. That never fails, not one time. There's another practical example about how God invites everybody, but he's only going to choose those that show up and those that show up correct. You can't come before God with a bunch of complaints. You don't come before the Lord with a bunch of complaining and murmuring. You come before him with thanksgiving and rejoicing and praise, and that's how you get his presence in the room. So over and over and over again, I'm trying to show you there are examples in the Bible and in life about how uh, you have to step to God in the right way. And everybody that believes you can just come to God any old kind of way you want to is going to get the shock of their life and find themselves bound hand and foot, thrown outside, away from Jesus' glory, where there's going to be other people out there who thought they could come to God any kind of way. And now they're out there crying and gnashing their teeth wishing that they were inside enjoying the banquet. God said, that's what my kingdom is like. Now, can you see why we need to preach and teach that? Can you see why we need to preach and teach what the Lord is teaching in the parable of the wedding invitation? That So let's go over the principles. Let me do a quick review, and then I'll be ready to close out. That God prepared the table in the Old Testament for the Jews. He sent prophets. They didn't want to come. So he sent more prophets and gave them more detail about what he was offering. And they seized the prophets, some of them, and they burned them and they killed them. And that enraged Father God. So what did he do? He destroyed the cities and he said, he burn up those cities and those murderers. Then he said they didn't deserve to come. So he opened up the banquet to the Gentiles and sent more people out to bring in as many people as they could until the wedding hall was filled with guests. But... The people that didn't step right got cast out. So that means when God opens his hand and extends to you an invitation to come into his blessing, you need to come, and you need to come correct. You don't need to come any kind of way you want to. Now we'll repeat. Can't you see that, that we need to preach and teach that in these times? That we need to come before the Lord with the, in the right way, with the right garments on, with the right good works covering us, when we come before God, we've been spending our time doing the works that he called us to do so that when we come before him, we can come before him with the sacrifice that he called us to make. Can you see that? As opposed to just doing what you want to do and just bringing what you think is right, you're going to get yourself tied hand and foot and cast out with a whole bunch of people that thought they could serve God or come before God any kind of way they wanted to. Can you see that? Can you see how important it is to know that as a believer? All right? Amen, amen. All right, so if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. Any kind of prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. And when you see me close my eyes, I'm praying in tongues and I'm asking the Holy Ghost if there's any healing, any deliverance, any financial words, any general prophetic words I need to release. Okay, so that's what I'm about to do now. All right, all right, didn't really get anything in particular, um, but so, God's will uh, be done, God be praised, so I'm excited about this teaching, I've only got a few more lessons in this No More Genius teaching, and I'll be through, 
then I'll move on to something else. But I am going to do something a little bit more extended about, you know, once saved, always saved, and people still arguing about whether or not you can lose your salvation and what that really means. I've gone over some of it tonight, but it's very important that we understand it as believers. And it's very important that you can explain it in your own words. Okay, very, very important. All right? All right, so that's it for tonight's teaching. Uh, my prophetic devotional is available, quarter two, on my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org. Uh, I'm releasing some more new music tomorrow, so remember to check me out for New Music Friday. I come on at 12 noon on New Music Friday to drop uh, some more uh, music because I'm putting my music out there. I just dropped uh, my second hymn uh, last week from my 150 Hymn Project, and uh, so I've got a lot of material that I'm releasing. So thank you so much for tuning in. So if you want to catch me live, I'm on every Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, on Facebook, Periscope, Twitter, YouTube. I'm on the second Thursday of every month, which is tonight, for No More Genies Teaching, 7, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. And I'm on Friday at noon for New Music Friday. Okay? Thank you so much. God bless. I hope you have a good rest of your, of your night. I hope you're staying in. If you're on lockdown, I hope you're honoring that. I hope you're just going out for groceries and medicine. We don't want to tempt the Lord. We don't want to be disobedient. We don't want to Take a chance on, you might be an asymptomatic here, and I'm not claiming that on nobody, I'm not claiming that on myself. But if it is so, you certainly don't want to infect anyone else in your family. So let's try to honor our social distancing and our lockdown, and let's continue to pray and believe God to take us through this storm. But when we come out on the other side, we want to rebuild according to his word and his pattern. All right? Amen, amen. God bless, and I'll see you tomorrow at noon for some brand new music. Amen.